so uh, we'll pr proceed with the paper uh, we don't have uh, we don't have ashad but we got someone better so we're we're good um hi hey guys uh, i don't know about better but i, I hope ashad will, will watch this sometime and <laughs> Anyways, so which statement about electric charges in a uniform, in a uniform electric field is not correct? So electric charges of the same magnitude, whether positive or negative, experience the same magnitude of force when placed in a in the same uniform electric field. This is correct, right? This is correct. Yes. Yeah, because uh, F was equals to E Q. And whether it's positive or negative, that can determine the direction of the force, but it's not going to determine the magnitude of it. So B, yep. the direction of the, B, yeah. <laughs> of the force on a positive charge, uh, on a positive charge placed in a uniform electric field is independent of the magnitude of the charge. Uh, this is also correct, right? Yes, because the direction is determined by whether it's positive or negative not the magnitude all right so c the magnitude of the force on a positive charge placed inside a uniform electric field is proportional to the magnitude of the electric field strength um, and i believe this is also correct this is also correct yes because stronger field means more force that is uh, yeah obvious <laughs> And you can see, from, yeah, you can see from the formula uh, as well. If electric uh, field strength goes up, force will also go up. D. Yep. The work done to move a positive charge in a certain distance in a uniform electric field is independent of the direction of the movement. That is wrong. Emma, can you explain? Uh, the work done is to move a positive charge a certain distance is independent of the. So this is incorrect because depending on the direction of the motion, you are moving against the field or towards the field. You might need to do less work or more work, right? So yeah. it's not independent of the direction. Hmm. All right. Um, and if you were moving, let's say like this, then probably you need to do more more work. Uh, no, then you're doing then you're doing work against the field, trying to move it towards you, but you're doing less work than if you were directly going against the field. Okay, okay, okay. So, let's, so let's say this was a positive, this was negative, and you have, let's say, a positive charge. Uh, if you're mm -hmm. moving it like this, then you'd need less work. But if you're moving it like this, you'd need more work. You need more work. So it is not independent of the direction. All right. right. So 32. The diagram shows a simple circuit. Which statement is correct? When switch S is closed, the EMF of the battery falls. Because where it is done against the internal resistance of the battery, um, does the EMF of the battery fall? Uh, uh, work is done against, no, it doesn't. Because internal resistance against the work will say be all out there, regardless of whether the switch is closed or not. Yeah, so EMF would remain the same. Um, and EMF doesn't really change. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe because there's a difference between EMF and potential difference, right? Is there a technical EMF. difference? Sorry? EMF is a power side by battery. Potential difference is uh, basically whatever voltage is used outside the battery. So potential difference does not include internal. Yeah. So EMF in particular would be. But EMF does. Yeah. Yeah. So B, when switch S is closed, the EMF of the battery falls uh, because work is done against the resistance of R. But I believe the EM wouldn't the EMF remain the same though? Yes, EMF would remain the same. So B is also incorrect. Yeah, because EMF, uh, can we put it simply by saying it's the, is the voltage that the battery is providing? Yes, that is exactly what the EMF is. <laughs> okay. So... When switch S is closed, the potential difference, now now they switch to potential difference. Now this could change. The potential difference across the battery falls because work is done against the internal resistance. Uh, and I, I believe this would also be wrong because uh, that's, that happens anyways, right? Yeah, that's going to happen anyways. So you'd have B, B as the answer because, wait. 
No, it might be C. You need to check this. No, no, no. But, you but, might need to check. Okay, but when switch S is closed, the potential difference mm -hmm. across the battery falls because where Achha, can... the potential difference across the battery is basically whatever voltage is being used outside the battery, right? Okay. So because the internal resistance is taking up some of the voltage, that means the potential mm -hmm. difference is less than the EMF. Yeah. So the internal resistance makes the potential difference less than the EMF. Okay. okay. So we'll, conc we'll conclude with C then. Yeah. Okay. And D, it would be wrong because the potential difference across the battery would remain the same uh, even if work is done here. In fact, the, the potential difference of the battery should increase, in fact, right? If work is done against resistance. Uh, no, it's basically the work is not being divided. So it's not because of R. It's because of the internal resistance that the fall is occurring, right? Because when you measure the potential difference across the battery, when there's nothing connected, you get the whole EMF. When there is something connected, you uh, get your internal resistance affecting the voltage value. Okay. So uh, not a very nice question. Anyways. Uh, 33, a resistor has resistance R. When the potential difference across the resistor is V, the current in the resistor is I, the power dissipated in the resistor is P, work, oh God, work W is done when charge Q flows through the resistor. What is not a valid relationship between these variables? Uh, I believe A is valid because P is equals to VI. Um, yes. B is also valid because the, you, if you remember this formula, so you can just rearrange that. So B is also valid. Uh, P is equal uh, to C is basically I square R. Yeah, which is which you can derive from which P. Is also you, valid. Yeah, which is also valid. Yeah, P equals to I square R. Yeah, and this so P is the one that's not valid. Yeah, basically. So you just and this isn't because we know that P is V square upon R, not V upon R. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if P is V I, that gives you P is V square upon R rather than P is V. Which does R. not match, so this is not valid. D yeah. is not valid. 34, a wire of resistance 9.55 ohms has diameter of this much millimeters. It is made up of a metal. I have... Yeah. It uh, is... <laughs> made up of a metal of resistivity this. What is the length of the wire? So you simply uh, think back to your formula for resistance, I believe. Uh, resistance. Yeah, what, what so it used to be this. Right upon it. Yeah. So you just put plug the values in this 9.55, uh, this 4.9 mm, into 10 to the power minus 7. Uh, we don't, we, we need to calculate length. And for area, you just put pi d square upon 4. Mm -hmm. 9.55. Do remember to convert your d. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, so Iman, do you have a calculator on you? Yes, I do. Uh, Give me a second. So this would be, we want the length of the wire. Okay. Yeah. Two. Two ten to the minus six. Which I am apparently struggling to use the calculator now. It's okay. Into pi into all right, so we're so the you put you pop that into your calculator, you get 1.2. Um, 35 charge carriers each of charge Q move along a wire of fixed length. The number density of the charge carriers in the wire is n. What is also required for this wire to determine the average drift velocity of the charge carriers in the terms of n and Q, if you remember your formula. 
uh, and yeah, Nakvi, basically, that's how you remember it. So this is the number of charge carriers, this is the area of the cross section, this is your elementary charge, this is your drift velocity, this is your current. Now, what do you have already? You have a... Uh, you have N and Q. You have N and Q, so you need, and you need to figure out uh, drift velocity. What, so they're asking what else do you need to figure this out? Um, so area of the cross section and current. So, or you could say current per unit of the cross section. That also works. Yeah. That's basically I upon A. So we can go with that. Okay, so let's just pick it off from here. Uh, 36, a potential divider circuit is constructed with one variable X and one fixed resistor Y as shown. Uh, so with one variable resistor, uh, sorry, X. The potential difference across X is VX and across Y is VY. As the resistance of X is increased, what happens to VX and VY? So that should be pretty straightforward. If the resistance of X increases, uh, the VX should also increase? Yep. And if there's a greater proportion of your voltage going to X, there'll be less left, left behind for Y, leading to a decrease in uh, Y. So for rises. So the answer is yeah. See. Yep. 37, a cell of electromotive force E and, and negligible internal resistance is connected to a circuit. The voltmeter has a very high resistance and reads a potential difference V out. What is the ratio of V out upon um, E? Okay, so we got to figure out what will... So here the uh, 12 ohm resistor doesn't matter because it's in parallel, so the voltage stays the same, right? Sorry, what? The 12 ohm resistor doesn't matter. Yeah, right? so, so in fact, if I could just so, draw this out, like, can we say it's something like this? Maybe this would be easier to visualize. This is the 12 ohm, and then you have your 4 ohm one and your 2 ohm one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we just want the ratio of voltage between the or ohm one and the EMFV. Okay, so and and the voltmeter you're saying is like this. So basically, yeah. whatever the voltage, whatever the voltage on the four ohm one will be the reading of on the voltmeter, uh, and the voltage yes. of the four ohm one it would be four upon six into E. Which should be yeah. Yeah. So, so this should be two over three E, which is D. So this is, yeah, this is your V out. If you divide V out by E. Uh, it cancels out and you get your ratio. Yeah, basically. Five resistors are connected as shown. What is the total resistance between points P and Q? So in let's just add them in series first. So this is uh, 28. 28 and that is 14 and that is 7. So you just do 1 upon 7 plus... Um, 1 upon 14 plus 1 upon 28. You and remember this is you either write this is equals to 1 upon resistance, or if you want to write this is equal to resistance, you just take the inverse of the entire thing. Um, Which would be 4 ohms. 4 ohms? Yeah. Okay, so a nucleus of Neptunium, I don't know, 2236. Yeah. <laughs> My nephew, okay, contains 93 protons and 143 neutrons. The nucleus decays with an emission of an alpha particle. The nucleus formed then emits a beta particle. Which diagram shows the changes in the number of protons and the number of neutrons in these nuclei? So if you emit an alpha particle, what is an alpha particle? It has four, uh, in fact, it's like, it's like helium, right? So two it has, protons and two neutrons. Yeah, two protons yeah. and two neutrons. So two protons and two, ne two neutrons uh, less, basically. So that's what you want. So you start off with, well, I, think, I guess you're all starting off at the correct spot where you have 93 and 143 neutrons. You now have two, um, we need to show two less protons. So you obviously need to go from 93 to 91. Uh, so, obviously, so hence you can kind of rule out C. Mm, now we, so, a, B, and D. Both and you're reducing. 
But, but which well, one shows two less? A is showing four less neutrons, right? So that doesn't work. Yeah, but B. So it's and, B or D. Yeah, B and D are fine with the alpha particle emission. The beta particle emission. No. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. What is beta particle? Now, what a beta particle emission does is it converts one neutron to a proton, right? So neutron reduces one more and proton increases one. Okay, so that gets gets cool so, here. Yeah. Uh, and can you quickly could you just explain this a bit how it converts? Because what you're doing is let's say you have two protons, right, and two neutrons. If you emit a beta particle, you're losing a negative charge. That means you're getting a positive charge, right? So one neutron is going to a proton, and converting releases a beta particle. Basically, and if you think of it, of this in in another in another way, obviously it has to there has to be some conversion going on because uh, the idea is it's coming from the nucleus. So you can't it's not an electron emission from the nucleus. You only have neutrons and protons. Um, exactly, though something has to convert to basically. make that. And 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 we we said that the, a neutron goes to a proton, uh, proton plus a beta particle. Yeah, a beta particle goes yes. away, so you basically have one less neutron and one more proton. So that's the idea. Yeah. Anyhow, an isolated neutron decays to produce a a proton, a beta particle, and an anti neutrino. Quite literally, what we were just saying, to be uh, how a neutron. Um, you know, decays to form a proton and a beta particle. Anyhow, which row gives the quark composition of the neutron and the proton and the type of force that gives rise to this reaction? I hope you re you remember this stuff, because I don't. Uh, I don't either. But up, up, down. Give me a second. Up, down, up. What, 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 what is? Up? Okay, a neutron is two down and one up. Neutron is two down and one up. Is there any logic to remember this? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. Proton positive up because the proton has two up and one down, and then the neutron is opposite. I suppose. Yeah, I I I think there was something to do with what what an up quark and what a down quark represents. Or say you need to. Yeah. It was like it I think this was like one upon. Yeah, I don't know. Anyhow, so this is due to what the strong interaction, the weak interaction. Okay, so weak. This is basically due to the strong interaction force because that's the force that happens between the neutrons and protons, right? So the force inside the nucleus is always the strong interaction force. All right, so we can uh, take. A then and then just quickly check our answer. No, 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 no. Whoops, whoops. It's 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 not A. Uh, it's B in fact because it's due to your weak interaction forces. And again, uh, I I don't think we have any logic behind this. We it's mostly um, memorization, uh, unfortunately, with with regards to your A syllabus. So uh, one logic here would be that it's an isolated neutron, so there's no other neutrons to have a strong interaction with. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that that could be a, a logic that interactions within a nucleus uh, are usually weak. If there was another, uh, you know, nucleus side by side, maybe then they could have strong interactions. But again, and I but think this is rather awkward stuff. Yeah, this is like because. Again, I remember in a, in my AS myself, I, I I don't think I was taught any logic behind this. It was just mostly memorization, which is why we were a little confused now because we don't remember AS that well. But uh, that was that. Uh, stupid ice cream. So that was there. Yeah. So that was it. Um. Uh. The rest of the questions were fine. We checked, so we're good. And that was it for this particular paper. And there's a stupid ice cream guy outside my window. That's it from our end.